everybody. Welcome to Knife Skills 101. I'm Leslie Layton, the Artistic Director of Los Robles Master Corral. Uh, and cooking is a great hobby of mine. I did actually go to chef school. I have an Associates of Science and Culinary Arts degree from California School of Culinary Arts, Le Cordon Bleu. Um, and I had a lot of fun in chef school and I learned a lot, but it is not what I do for a living. I'm actually a professional musician. But we're gonna talk about chef skills and knife skills and the anatomy of a knife. So I'm gonna start with anatomy of a knife because you might not know what it is. Here's my knife. So this is obviously the handle. You have the rivets. This is called the tang. You see that? The tang. The tang is basically the metal part of the knife that goes through the handle. Uh, this is the butt of it, okay? This is the finger guard, this, this piece that comes down and meets the blade. This is the bolster, okay? This is obviously your blade, the cutting edge, the spine of the knife, the point, and this is the tip of the knife. So that's the basic uh, deal of it. I'm gonna talk to you first about choosing a knife set and then we're gonna talk about the different knives. Um, so when you choose a knife, you do wanna make sure that you have chosen a knife that has a steel tang. Okay, this is very important. Knives, and they do make them, and, and uh, you know, I get it, there are different budgets out there, uh, but a knife where the steel stops where it meets the handle simply means somewhere down the line your knife is probably gonna break off from the handle and you're gonna to have to get another set of knives. Uh, if you have a knife where the tang goes all the way through it, this knife is not gonna break. The handle may become old and fall apart. You can replace the handle, but the knife is not gonna break off from the handle, okay? So this knife is kind of almost a forever thing. The other ones, not so much. So you wanna make sure that you choose one with a tang. Second thing, uh, I usually choose, and right or wrong, and y'all can argue the point with me, that's fine. Uh, I tend to choose the knife set that I purchase based on the chef's knife. Although, truth be told, the chef's knife that I like to use, it's difficult to find in a set, but that's the way it goes. Uh, you want to make sure that a chef's knife balances for you. So how you check that is you put your index finger pointed forward, and, where, and you put it where the blade meets the finger guard, and your knife should do what my knife is doing. It is balancing perfectly, okay? This knife is the knife that came with my set, and don't get me wrong, I love my set of knives. They are beautiful. I almost never use this chef's knife, and this is the one that came with the set, and here's the reason, <laughs> okay? It is handle heavy. If I want to balance this knife, I'm going to have to put my hand, my finger somewhere. It's not going to balance. Um, this, it's a great knife, but it's, it's not comfortable for me because the handle weighs too much. So that means I'm having to put forth more effort into the blade. A balanced blade like this, it's effortless and you can, you can use it for uh, quite some time uh, before you're tired. In terms of chef knives, Often what comes with the set is this, it's an eight inch chef's knife. And that's because most of the time at home cooks are not very comfortable using really huge blades. Um, for me, this is too short. And, it, and as I said, it, it's not well balanced. So I use uh, this chef's knife. This is a 10 inch and in, for my hand, it balances really quite well. Um, so that's the one that I tend to use. I also have this one. This is another 10 inch chef's knife. This is Japanese made. Uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful knife. Um, I have a 12 inch and then I have a 14 inch. Now the 14 for such a large blade, this is, I have to place my hand a little bit down the, down the blade. Eh, not quite. I'm gonna find it. There it is. So, and that's because the blade is so long, but really this is, this is balanced rather well. This is a Sabatier from France. Um, and this, by the way, is a carbon steel knife. This is a stainless steel knife. This is a carbon steel knife. 
This knife is gonna hold its edge much longer and much better, but it's a bear to keep clean. The stainless steel knife, much easier to keep clean, doesn't hold its edge nearly as long. So you kinda have to choose, do you wanna have to futz with the cleaning of the knife or you know, do you wanna have to sharpen it more? How does that work? You have to decide that when you're choosing a knife. Carbon knives also tend to be much cheaper because they're, the maintenance is, is tougher, but you'll notice the tang still goes, see, it's probably hard to see because this knife is old, but the tang, there is a tang that is going through the handle. Uh, the, only, the only thing when I go to clean this knife, I have to take a lemon and I cut the lemon and then I just rub both sides of the blade with the lemon. Keeps it perfectly clean. You'll see this one is in very good condition. You can see that I have not cleaned this knife in a while. You see those black spots? It's kind of icky. That's what happens to carbon steel when you don't keep them clean. So know that going in. All right, so you've seen the different sizes of chef's knives. I'm gonna just quickly take you through the other knives. This one is a Santoku. I have two sizes here. This one's a little bit longer. These are meant for an up and down motion. Okay, they're an up and down motion. They're not meant to rock. A chef's knife is built to rock this way. It rocks up and down, okay? This one, up and down motion, all right? Uh, you would use this for chopping, although I tend to use my chef's knife for virtually everything. Uh, this is called a utility knife. We use this for slicing, uh, which reminds me of my friend uh, Tim, his dad, who we called Pap Pap. Uh, he was at his uh, nieces and nephews one time, and they said, hey, Pap Pap, can you, can you carve the turkey? And he said, sure, no problem. They hand him a knife, and it's as dull as they come. And he says, well, where's your sharpening stone? And they just stare at him. So he marches out of the front door of their place, and he goes and he sits on the curb, and he literally sharpened the knife on the cement of the curb. Uh, I don't recommend that unless you really know what you're doing, but Pap Pap was chef at Coconut Grove and Beverly Hills Hotel for years, so he knew what he was doing. He could sharpen it on some cement. I wouldn't attempt it. Uh, this is a bread knife, and they're always serrated on the bottom. Uh, pairing knives. Most sets come with these two pairing knives. This is very typical. One is short, one is long. This is another pairing knife, and it's curved to kind of a bird beak almost. This is super handy when you're doing things like tournée, which we will get to in the second segment. Uh, this is a cleaver, and this one, boom, right? That's what it's for, fabricating meat. So you would hold a leg here, right at the joint, boom. And they're weighted so that the blade is very heavy. Uh, and that's, that's so that your motion is this way. Okay, uh, let's see, scissors. You need to have a good set of kitchen shears. Please do not cut your child's art project paper with your kitchen shears. All it does is make them dull and then you have to sharpen them. So don't, don't save yourself some, some time and hassle. Here's a really large bread knife. I cut the living daylights out of my finger using this one time. Um, it was actually the first time I used it, and that brings up a good point about knife safety. I'm going to tell you a couple quick things about knife safety. When you get a brand new knife, don't use it for the first time in, in a situation where you're going to be in a rush or you're nervous because maybe people are coming and you're throwing a big dinner. Learn how to use the knife in calm circumstances. Every knife is different. You have to get used to the weight, the length, everything of the knife. I rushed. I used that knife when I shouldn't have, and I almost took my finger off with it. So don't do that. <laughs> Practice with a knife first in a calm setting so that you get used to the balance, the weight, the length of the blade, very important. Just practice slicing things, that's all you have to do. Uh, and you can always use the vegetables for super stock, so it's not like it's gonna go to waste, yeah? Uh, also, an oyster or clam uh, shucker, uh, you stick it in, go around, pry it open. That's what those are for. And of course, a steak knife, yeah? Um, steak knives don't often come with a set, but they're good to have. These are boning knives that I just mixed up, so now I've gotta check and see. Ah, that's, that's the meat. So 
Boning knives should have a little play. You see that I'm able to bend the blade slightly. And they're oddly shaped in comparison to the rest of your knives. This is meant to separate flesh from bone, okay? So for steak, for cow, for pig, you would use the stiffer knife, okay? This knife is for fish boning. Look at the play in that, okay? A fish deboning knife needs to be very flexible, all right? And that's so that you can really get under. Fish, fish is, is a little bit harder to be debone, so you want to make sure that you have a, a fish boning knife that has, has more play in it. So those are the knives. Uh, you may have to buy a couple things separately. Care and feeding of knives. Get yourself a block if you want to keep them on your countertop. It's, it's nice and easy. If you don't like to have uh, blades on the countertop, and, and if you have children or grandchildren, I, can, I get it. You don't want them coming over and grabbing a knife. So you can keep them in a drawer. If you keep it in a drawer, buy one of those wooden drawer, made for a drawer knife that has the slots. And the reason you want to do that is to protect your blades. They sit in the blades and also to protect your fingers. You don't I've seen it happen. People go, oh, let me get a knife from my knife drawer. And they open this drawer and there's all these knives just thrown in the drawer. And I watch them dive in and I'm like, okay, I have to look away. I have to look away. How are you not cutting your finger every other time you do that? So help yourself. Get yourself a little wooden thing. If you don't want to get the wooden thing or it doesn't fit in your drawer, edge guard. This is plastic, okay? And it's simply puts the edge in. That way, if I reach in, I can grab it on the blade end and nothing is gonna happen to my hand, okay? These are relatively cheap. I will give you links at the end of the episode uh, so you can buy some of these things. Um, the other thing that you wanna have, and I'm just gonna clear some space, uh, the other thing that you wanna have is a sharpening stone. That is very important for the care and feeding of your knives. Um, and a sharpening stone, oh, sorry, that weighs a lot. Uh, this is a bowl full of water with a sharpening stone that has been soaking for about 30 minutes, roughly. Um, if you use your sharpening stone often, you don't need to soak it probably that long. But if, you're, if your stone is dry, you, you do need to soak it uh, before you use it, okay? Um, sharpening stones usually have two sides. One side is a little bit more abrasive, the other side is very fine. Obviously you start with the more abrasive and you work your way to the fine side. Um, so, I'm gonna show you how to use it. I Notice I've put it on a towel. And the reason is because if I put it on my board, it's gonna move around, this is not good. Okay, so I put it on a towel to keep it steady. Uh, you wanna have food grade or food safe mineral oil. This is, this is just a good thing for knives, period. Uh, I'm putting some mineral oil directly on the stone and I'm just rubbing the mineral oil in. Uh, if your stone is really, really dry, i.e. you have not used it in a long time, what you're gonna see when you put the mineral oil in is it's just gonna go, it's just gonna suck all the mineral oil into the stone. If it does that, you need to put more mineral oil on it. So as you can see, this is very glossy. You see how the mineral oil is a little zhuzhy. Uh, yeah, that's a word I use, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'm just gonna dab this a little bit so that it's not, you know, a complete mess. And then when you go to sharpen your knife, you're gonna hold your handle, you're gonna put your non-dominant hand on top of the blade. You're gonna hold the blade at a 45 degree angle. You start at the tip, you're gonna move in a counterclockwise circle and you're gonna go, Yeah? You would do that on that side for two minutes. I like to flip because I'm lazy and I don't wanna to have to move somewhere else or whatever. So I just flip it around. Now, if you use your left hand, you do need to go clockwise, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm not quite as swift with my non-dominant hand as I am with my other hand. Um, and you make sure that you do it again for two minutes. Then you would flip your stone over, you would put more mineral oil on it, let's say that I've done that, and then you're gonna do the same business on 
both sides of your knife, okay? Uh, you do not need to bear down hard on your knife. It's not necessary to do that. Um, I keep, by the way, I keep my stone. It's in my knife drawer and I keep, I keep it in a, a cigar box. I know that'll send some of you into some laughter, I hope. Um, then you take your honing steel. Most of these come with your knife set. Please put it on a towel because if you don't, that's what happens. Put it on a towel, brace it there. You hold it, so I've got a good hold on it. And then 45 degree angle, make sure both sides, okay? And even amount for both sides. Otherwise your blade will not be even. Hear that sound? That's a sharp blade. When it makes that sound, it's sharp. Be careful when you run your finger. It, I've done it a lot, so I know I'm not, I know how much pressure I'm not going to hurt myself. Um, but certainly you would figure it out <laughs> soon if it's, if it's not sharp. Now let's quickly talk about holding your knife. Um, once you get good with a chef's knife, which is just through, through using it, I promise you it's the knife you're going to use for 80% of your work in the kitchen, literally. Um, this knife I use more than anything else. This one is stainless steel because I don't want to have to clean it all the time. Little, you know, so it's a trade-off. It means it has to be sharpened. Um, also, if you're afraid of sharpening your knife, there is this. I'll put a link at the end of the episode. Uh, it's a sharpener. It has two pieces of steel in the bottom that are very sharp. And you would just hold it down with the handle up the top, just in case, right? It protects your hand. You start at the bolster and you draw it down all the way to the tip. And then you would use your honing steel uh, again at the end, uh, you know, uh, uh, same amount, even number of times on both sides. So holding your knife, this, nay, nay, this, nay, 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 nay. So look what happens. A chef's knife is meant to rock, okay? It's meant, tip, it's meant to do this kind of motion. That's what this knife, that's the reason that it's curved at the end, okay? So if you're holding your knife like this, look at what's happening to my wrist. And by the way, that's really uncomfortable. If I hold it like this, same kind of deal. If I hold my knife correctly, so I put my thumb, here's the, this is the finger guard, the blade, right, bolster. I'm putting it here by the finger guard, my index finger only by the finger guard. My other three fingers go on the handle. Only those three fingers go on the handle. So you're here, you're there, yeah, these, okay. Now watch what happens. How easy is that? Notice this is not doing some weird, unergonomic something or other. I could literally take these and just do that, but I wouldn't, but I could. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's actually, that would be a good way to mince something, yeah? So that's how you use your blade and how you hold your blade. Uh, the more that you get used to that kind of grip, I think the happier that you will be. Um, and I think that's probably about all that I'm gonna tell you about it. I think I mentioned the difference in the steel, right? Chromium doesn't have chromium. This is carbon, this is stainless. 1810, 18.8, those are the grades that you want on the stainless. This has no chromium. The top number, 18, is the amount of chromium in the blade. The bottom number, eight or 10, is the amount of nickel in the blade. This will not have any chromium in it. It's the reason that it doesn't stay clean, yeah? So uh, that's the beginning of knife skills. I'm gonna come back in a little while and show you some knife cuts to make your life in the kitchen, I hope, a little bit easier and more joyful. Meanwhile, for some mixology, uh, Jasper Randall and Sarah Mann are gonna tell you about what things you might wanna stock in your bar uh, and what toys uh, you wanna have in your bar to make all kinds of fun drinks. Hey, Sarah and Jasper, it's all you. Hi everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm Jasper. And um, 
We're here to talk about bar essentials. Should we take these off? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, don't breathe while we do this. Okay. These are good for welding ships, too. We're going to talk to you about um, the things that we feel are essential in a, a, a proper bar. Proper bar. Okay, let's start. What's the two most, what's the most? And it's all subjective. So whatever we say really doesn't mean anything if it's not what you want or what you like or what you prefer. So as with anything, you can make it whatever you want, uh, whatever uh, budget you have, uh, whatever your specific tastes are. Uh, you might have more of one than another. So this is all just our opinion and nothing more. Where's the camera? I don't know, but I feel like all I'm doing is looking at myself. <laughs> Is it there? I think is it it's there? there. It's over, I think it's it's over up there. there. Okay. No, I, or is it? No, that's, nope. I have no <clears> idea. <throat> anyway, whatever. So I think the most important thing that you're going to need is alcohol. Alcohol. Which we have a lot of. All sorts of alcohol. Uh, most of which we did not buy. Most of it was gifts. The one that we do buy a lot of is tequila and wine. I buy a lot of wine. Uh, vodka. Uh, some kind gin. of tequila, a gin if you're a gin drinker, a good whiskey. Um, if you're running low on uh, alcohol, just have a housewarming party. <laughs> they don't need to know if it's actually you know a new house or anything like that. Just call it a housewarming party and everyone will bring you way too much alcohol that you will never be able to consume. Uh, we have a lot. We have, we have <clears throat> wine from 1990 something. We have all sorts of stuff. A lot of bottles of whiskey. And we have a dog that's squeaking and playing. Okay. Our dog's an alcoholic because we give her uh, alcohol just to get rid of it. Yeah. Okay. No. So, so you need some alcohol. We'll show you in a separate uh, video what our little bar mm -hmm. looks like. But right now we're just going to show you some other things. So uh, you need some glassware. But these are specific glassware. I mean, there's, that's the thing, is that you can get as specific uh, as you want. There's all sorts of different glassware for different drinks. Um, Wine glasses, martini glasses. Tumblers, high ball. This, would, this is a low ball, correct? A tum tumbler? Okay. This is for something like on the rocks. This is like a rocks glass. Um, but again, I like the shape. It holds liquid. It has little thumb thumb okay. indentations right here, which are really nice. You start getting a little, you know, you're not going to drop it. <laughs> that's really what they're for. So you need some glasses. So that's that. This comes in really handy. This is a just your average shot glass. However, this one has measurements on it, which we don't always adhere to. But you know, roughly like I don't have my glasses on. Well, there's there's half ounce, ounce, ounce and a half. But yeah. then there's there's also little. We have this little handy. Little, Kits that you can buy. It's, I don't know if it's called a kit, but and with this, it's like you have one ounce, you have two ounces. Oh, I always thought this was one shot, and that was half a shot. Okay. Anyway, um, this you know, thing drinks, is cool. Drinks are mixed in ratios, it so basically, it's you have like one part this, two parts of this. So you know, generally they go off of ounces, but. You know, one gallon of vodka, two gallons of mixer. I mean, have a. This, it has a muddler. Which can also be used for beating animals, children. Uh, the muddler obviously is for uh, this guy. Yes, or in there. This whatever. is from the Bellagio Hotel, which was uh, a bachelorette party of mine. But again, if uh, many uh, drink mixers, cocktail mixers, uh, the lid can double as a uh, shot measure. So I believe that's an ounce. So you can measure yeah. your drinks that way as well and uh, not have to exactly have something separate. This is also in the kit. This that's, a, goes, that's a strainer. This goes on top here and then you can strain this way or... Well, sometimes they mix in, in glasses. You stuff. can do this and pour it out like that. They kind of serve the same purpose. I'm guessing the majority of people watching this know all of this stuff. I don't know, but we were asked to make this video, so we are. And then it comes in this little... A little stirrer. Spoon. Stir. Okay. A, a, mini, a mini muddler, which I've actually used that for. Um, old fashions. So that's that. This is that's the kit stuff. Um, just some other little things that I think are nice to have. Orange bitters, just keep those on hand. They, one little dash in the margarita is kind of nice and also for old fashions. 
Um, well, they have aromic bitters as well. Luxardo. Just for some little flavoring. Ch cherries are also good for old fashions. That's like, those are the best. Also like super expensive for a jar. Um, you can make your own simple syrup, which I usually do. I'll throw in Basically rosemary. Basically sugar. Just it's sugar and sweeter. water, equal parts. Um, but I got this just to show you, you can buy it if you're feeling super lazy. It's just sugar and water. Uh, but you can always do it and throw a little rosemary in there. You can do a ginger simple syrup. You can do... Um, yeah, you can infuse. Infuse. A lot of cocktails have infused. Yeah, we like to do all sorts of things like that. Fun little... Um, these are blue cheese olives. Jasper loves these in a martini. Yeah. So that's nice to have. And um, these are really important. These are sugar cubes. They're great for uh, old fashions. Needed for old fashions. And now we will walk you into our bar and show you the giant amount of uh, liquor that, that we will never be able to consume. Okay, here we are in our piano room slash bar. Say hello and talk about some things. Hello. A whole lot of things that I have no idea what they are. No, that's not true. So we have uh, obviously different kinds of alcohol in here, anything from mezcal um, to uh, regular tequila. Actually, we have a lot of tequila here. That's all. We have a lot of tequila uh, and mezcal. Vodkas, uh, whiskeys, different kinds of whiskeys, gin. Then we have uh, anything from some mixers, Aperol, Aperol Frangelico, mm -hmm. more, more tequila, Luxardo. There's a pretty shaker in the front. There's some wine down there. And then we have we basically get to a dog. Uh, build a bar. And uh, we have more stuff. Campari, so, uh, Triple Sec, Maker's Mark, more vodka, Kahlua. Lots of whiskeys. Grand Marnier. And then we have... Lots of wines. This is wine. And then we have a fridge in the garage that's full of cold wine. So this is like the reds, mostly. And there's another piano. Ooh. And a growling dog. Hey, thanks Sarah and Jasper. That was seriously fun. Just promise us that you're not gonna drink and then try to practice your knife skills, okay? <laughs> okay, so um, I do wanna show you a couple of other quick tools um, that you'll wanna have in your kitchen. One of them is what I'm wearing in my pocket. It's an instant read thermometer. They're really, they're relatively cheap. Um, unlike a thermometer that you just stick in and it stays in, this one is usually more accurate um, and you can just quickly check the temperature of something so you know whether or not you need to pull it uh, or if you've overcooked it or it's still undercooked. Um, but, it, you know, you stick it into the meat and you'll watch and the temperature will come up and just wait until it settles on a temperature and then, and then you know uh, what the temperature is. Um, you'll want to have a zester. This really is not so much about zest that you're going to use in a dish. I usually use a much finer grater, which you're going to want to have. This is technically a nutmeg grater, but when I want really fine zest in something, because it's going to be part of the dish, uh, we're going to eat it, then I use this. Um, this one is meant really more for garnish, and it can create some fun swirls and things for you. Um, you definitely want a good peeler. I have two different kinds. Hey, dogs. Hey, Sophie and Winston. <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> so uh, two different kinds of peelers. This was my mother's peeler, and I have never found a better. It's the reason I still have it. I have the more expensive one. I'm just not comfortable using this peeler. This one, I'll walk a mile to get that. Uh, you'll want a good set of pliers because if you need to pull fish bones out of fish you need and they need to be needle nosed yeah and and please don't use your regular like pliers in your toolkit just buy yourself a, a separate set of you know pin nose the needle nose sorry needle nose uh pliers and off you go uh and just put them in your kitchen drawer with your other tools and that's that's what it is uh, if you want a great cheese or you need something grated larger this one is great it can literally sit on top of a bowl and go to town so those are the graters. Now, we're gonna get to, you know, I, I need to remember not to do the onion first.
because that will set me in motion, let me tell you. All right, we're gonna start with the carrot. So there's different kinds of cuts that are used in French kitchens. Um, and, and when you see something that has been cut correctly, it, it really does separate an amateur at home cook from a more professional cook. Uh, and these things are not difficult. Uh, they're, they're really quite easy to learn. So a brunoise is a very fine dice. I'm gonna show you that shortly. Uh, and that's just a quarter, uh, sorry, an eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch by eighth of an inch. It's just eight inch, very small square, yeah? Um, Macedoine, which is quarter inch all around. Then you have Parmentier, half an inch carré, which is three quarters of an inch. Um, and then most of you are probably familiar with the Julienne cut. You see that in restaurants. Uh, dogs, hey, hey, can you beep someplace else? <laughs> it has to be like right here. Hey, no, go, scoot, scoot. Oh my God. Okay. Ah. So uh, Julienne is just usually the little sticks, right? They're small, they're little sticks, and they look, they look more fun and interesting on a plate. Um, Julienne is one eight by one eight by two inches long. Okay, so usually when you're going to make brunoise, you make julienne and then you cut them down to brunoise, yeah? Uh, allumette is the matchstick. It's one eighth by one eighth by three inches long. So you could also do allumette and then brunoise, yeah? Um, and then batonnet is slightly larger. It's still a stick, but it's quarter inch by quarter inch by two inches, yeah? And then there's some other cuts, uh, oblique, which is a rolled cut. Uh, rondelle, which are basically when you cut round discs. Uh, and then there's a chiffonade, which I'm going to show you, um, which you would use for basil a lot or something that you want to be slightly stringy. Uh, dogs, please be gone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is definitely at home DIY. Uh, and yes, I could go back and redo this, but somehow I'm just not going to. So <laughs> this is not my first take. There you go. Uh, and they keep interrupting me, so great. Uh, we're gonna do right now, um, uh, now the cats are getting involved. Uh, it's like an animal farm. I live in an animal farm. Uh, we're gonna take a carrot and we're gonna, we're gonna do julienne with the carrot and then brunoise after julienne. So carrots, of course, this one has been peeled. Uh, carrots are by nature not the easiest things to turn into matchsticks. Uh, although it's also not that hard either. The first thing you need to do is what we call square off because it's, it's a round product. We have to square it off. So the first thing that I'm going to do, this carrot is quite crooked. So I'm just going to cut it straight on the end. Uh, and I have over here, I have a refuse bowl uh, going and I'm going to put that in there. The refuse bowl, so, you know, this end that I just cut off of the carrot is perfectly good to use in stock. Uh, or in the making of a sauce, if you, you know, um, you can make soups out of them. So don't throw them away. Uh, you're gonna use them down the line. Um, so we have now cut that end, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go about two inches. Uh, if I was being really particular, I would have measured that, but I'm not, not gonna do that, because are you really gonna measure it? <laughs> Are your guests going to do that? There's my question. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to square the carrot, we hope. So you're going to cut this way. Notice that I'm holding my knife the way I showed you in the last segment. And then I'm holding my product with my hand. It's like a little, I, there's the claw hold, which is like this. You, you make a claw and you put it on the product. Your knife hits your knuckle, I'll show you here. Your knife hits your knuckle as the guide and your thumb is used to push the product forward and you hit your knuckle. I tend to like to spread my hands out a little more than the claw cut. So I have, I have a tendency to spread my hands out and that means that usually right on a small product, I've got three fingers. My thumb is, sometimes my other fingers are bracing it like in the case of this roly poly carrot. Uh, but notice I'm curling them up so that I don't cut off the tips of my fingers. You really don't want to do that. Uh, so that's two sides. Here comes side three. And then side four. And I have more or less a square. I've made a round carrot into a square carrot. Uh, I'm going to, for the sake of the end product, because I can see where I wasn't, 
perfectly brilliant. I'm just going to even it up. There we go. So now I'm going to touch. Now I have a square, a square carrot that's basically a rectangle. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to turn it into julienne. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to see where I'm going and I'm, I'm checking for a quarter or excuse me, an eighth of an inch because julienne is eighth of an inch. So I've got my knife up against my knuckles so that I don't cut the tips of my fingers and I press down. So always tip first, press down, tip, press down. Okay. And then I'm going to do another one. And then I can, should be able to get one more in here. Okay, there we go. That one's maybe a little thin. Then I'm gonna take these because these are now, we have a thinner version of what we just had. So now I need to do another uh, eighth of an inch. Boy, I really wanna say quarter of an inch today. <laughs> I'm gonna do another eighth of an inch cut. And I'm gonna make these little julienne carrots. And that gives me this. So I have three that are little, little, little sticks. Yeah. So if I want to go, this, this would be Julienne. You can do the entire carrot. I could keep going. I'm not going to take the time to do that. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into Brunoise. So from, from a technical standpoint, if you want to get your knife moving quicker, you have to learn to get your hands in the right position. So you can see here that my thumb is able to push the product forward. These other three fingers I'm using to stabilize my product and I'm going to take it away from the product for a minute and to guide my knife. So you see my hand position. There's my non-dominant hand position. A lot of times if it's a large product, you'll see me stick two fingers out to grab it because I, I have small hands. Uh, if you have a large hand, the claw will be very comfortable for you. My friend Tim has big hands. And so Tim uses more the claw, which is what his dad, Pap Pap, used to use. Uh, my hands are way smaller. So I, I have a tendency if I'm using some, if I'm cutting something large, I, I, I tend to do this instead of this because I, my hands are just not large enough to wrap around the product, so I need to do that. We'll get to that in a minute. So you have your hands in a good, and I'm, I'm at a slightly abnormal position because I want you to be able to see my hands, but you'll see how my left thumb is gonna press forward. Hold on, let's just make sure I get this. And I'm gonna press it forward, and I'm cutting, and I can go faster, um, but I'm just gonna show you what's coming out of the end of my knife here. So we have this, this is Brunoise. It's little tiny eight, eighth by eighth by eighth square. That's all it is, okay? And the thing that's nice about Brunoise, uh, obviously it'll cook in seconds <laughs> for one thing. Uh, but you know, it, it, from a guest standpoint, it, it's nice to see that you have, you know, made a, a lovely effort uh, oh my God, did you really just jump up here in the middle of this out? Come on, this is gonna be one of those episodes. I, it's just like, I can't get it done today. I don't know, you guys were so good yesterday, but I hated that footage. Okay, <laughs> so here we are. Today we have the cats. All right, so we have Brunoise. Uh, oh gosh, I hope you all are having so much fun during the pandemic, it's making me a crazy person. Uh, so that's, that's that basic cut. Um, a chiffonade, it, by the way, if you just, if you're just going for, I need speed, I'm now taking the other half of my carrot. I need speed. I don't care about this Brunoise Julienne thing. Great. Uh, let me, I am going to take the tip off cause that's, ugh. so if that's what you need, you know, here we go. All right. And then you get discs. All right. Uh, mine come out f mostly fairly even in terms of thickness, because I've done this a lot. Um, but, you know, if you're looking to up your game a little bit, this right here, like this little Brunoise right here, it's very lovely. You know, do, do I do that often for my guests? No. Uh, and that, <laughs> that's because I have a tendency to have uh, 
dinner parties on holidays, which means I was at church before uh, conducting or singing or some other crazy something. Um, and, and so I, I, I should have done the prep before to do something fancy, which I didn't do. Now we're gonna take potato. Uh, I have peeled this potato. I have halved the potato. You see that there's only a half a potato left. Um, and this is called tournée, which simply means turned or to turn. Um, and the object is to make a football shaped item out of this hunk of potato. So, you know, what's fun about it is you can serve a potato like that, <laughs> or you can turn it into a tournée shape and you know, it's gonna look nicer on your plate. So the tournée technically is seven cuts. Uh, sometimes I manage that and then there's those other times because I don't ever practice this. So I'm holding, see how I'm gripping my potato? This knife, I'm, I'm choking up on this knife a little bit, okay? And I might even do this. See how my finger is like this? And I'm going to do this motion, this motion. Okay, so my thumb is up here. I've got my knife. It's kind of curled. As you get, this is just a, this is the curly cube paring knife, right? But you could use any paring knife. I just happen to like this one for this deal. And I'm going to pull it close to me. So it goes, so I'm starting at a point and I'm going, cut one, that was a really bad cut. So I kind of legendarily bad, because this potato was from yesterday. <laughs> Oh, there's cut three. Here comes cut four. Cut five. Uh, cut six. And seven is my flat side, although I will do one more cut to have a smaller, because this actually only did six. Here's cut seven. All right. And then I have a flat side of it. Uh, usually what happens, and by the way, this refuse over here, I'm not gonna throw that away. I'm gonna use that in stock or soup, okay? Uh, don't, you know, don't ever throw away the cuttings when you're making pretty food. Don't, don't throw away your cut, you know, your, your, your clippings, your refuse, because you can definitely use it uh, for something else. So I am going to go, I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit. One cut. You can see that I'm now trying to make more of a football shape. You know, my bad for using a day old potato, what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, yeah, things not to do in the kitchen, okay? Seriously. All right. Ugh, come on. Uh, so what happens with, with the darn thing when you, it's now soft. So it's very, it's very hard for me to work with the product, but you can see that I've turned it into a little football shape that will sit very nicely on your plate. Uh, if I want to, I can clean up the ends like this. And there you are. Um, and you know, you could serve three or four of these uh, on a plate with tournados of beef if you wanted, and then brunoise or julienne carrots and maybe some asparagus, asparagus, it would be a lovely, uh, lovely looking thing. Let's get rid of this. Uh, and then of course you can also, you know, you can take the little tournée and you wanna be fast in the kitchen, here we go. Uh, let, me turn, let me turn so you can see. You know, practice is really what makes this easy and what makes it happen. Um, if you don't ever practice it, it's really hard, uh, you know, to, um, to make good food or, or pretty food. I'm gonna quickly show you a chiffonade. So let's pretend that this is actually a basil leaf because red leaf lettuce was all I had and it's going to be slightly difficult because of the spine. I'm gonna cut the end off of it. Uh, red, leaf, red leaf lettuce spines don't like to bend. Uh, basil leaves will bend quite well. So what you would do is you would roll the basil leaf like a cigarette, or for some of my friends, just like your joints. Uh, and you have this, yeah? And then you simply hold it down on the board. You put your finger in the way that I showed you so you don't cut yourself. 
and then you simply slice like this. Yeah? Done. And then what you have are these little ribbons or chiffonade. Yeah? Little little chiffonade ribbons. Uh, it's, it's a nice way if you want to do, let's say uh, you're doing, um, you're serving tomato with a nice cheese and some high quality olive oil and you want a garnish on that, chiffonade basil on the top would be lovely. So that's a good, a good use and a way to do that. Now let's do the onion. So obviously I have halved, I've peeled it and I've halved it. This is the end with the hairs on it and this is the pointy end. So I'm gonna leave the hairs on this onion and I'm gonna take my chef's knife and I'm gonna just cut off the pointy end and get rid of that. So now I have this, yeah? What you do, you take your knife and cut in. I'm cutting down. This is the quick way to cutting an onion, yeah? I tend to do this with my hand because Onions, when you start to do this, they will start to fall apart on you. Uh, so it's best to secure them. At least that's in my experience. So I've now done lengthwise cuts. I've done, oh gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've done about nine lengthwise down cuts. If I try to pick this up, and I will, you can see where I've split it. And I don't want to mess too much because it will fall apart on me. Then you take your knife horizontally, put your hand flat on the top. Sometimes, because I made so many cuts, I'm going to need to cup slightly. So I'm doing a, a claw on the top and I'm cutting horizontally. Make sure your fingers are not in the way, okay? Notice how I'm coming up with my hand as the knife gets closer, okay? Then when I get to the top, This is when I am gonna just go flat. I know it's making it hard for you to see, but I'm doing it flat and I'm going in. So I've done about five or six cuts that way. And now I am just going to go like this. That's all that's left. It's the hair, the hairy onion part. So I was grasping the hairy onion part uh, and I just cut down and this is, this is the cut that you get. It's a rough, what we would call rough chop. But if you're, if you're having to do a lot of onions, that is the quickest way to cut an onion. Okay. Uh, if you're doing rings for something, and then if you want this, uh, and again, knife skills, I'm holding my knife the way I showed you in the first segment, hand on top, and I'm just doing a rocking motion like this. Yeah, it's just a rocking motion. And I'm just, oh, this is why I saved the onion to last because, oh my God, it's gonna make my eyes water now. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's pretty much uh, a quick way to, to learn to use this. I also use my chef's knife even to take out the center of a tomato. When, you, when you're holding your knife correctly, you have absolute control and you can do tiny things with the tip. If you are holding your knife this way, there is no way on God's green earth you're going to have control to do that. Um, you know, so, so you, you don't, you don't want to do that. If you're doing rings, I'm just going to show you rings. Uh, I didn't peel this onion all the way. Uh, so I just, I just cut off the pointy tip of the onion. And now I'm grabbing, uh, see this is when you don't prepare. I usually am so prepared. Um, so, uh, you just peel the onion. Oh, my eyes are watering like crazy. This is for rings. Okay. So I usually do, I'll do sometimes half rings for certain types of dishes. Yeah. Um, some French dishes. So I cut off first the end cause the, all right. So I'm making my little claw. I have my thumb here. This is, here's my guide. Yeah. And I'm cutting yeah just like this so 
so on and so forth. I'm not going to do the whole thing. But it gives you rings, yeah? And you pull them apart, and here you are. Little, little rings. And these, these are really nice for certain dishes. Um, if you're going to saute them in butter, yum, uh, or olive oil, uh, that's really a great thing. Okay, so I'm going back to Jasper and Sarah, who are going to show you how to mix a drink or two. Hey, you guys, it's all you. All right, so one of my favorite uh, cocktails is an uh, old-fashioned, because I'm old-fashioned. Yep. And uh, as with anything, if I don't know how to do it, um, I watch like 30 YouTube videos until I understand every possible way to make it, and then I make it my own. Um, Can I make one with you? Yep. Okay. Make sure you have the easy grip uh, glasses. So, you know, that's a must. And uh, <clears throat> very simple ingredients, uh, sugar cubes, um, orange bitters, or you can use aroma bitters, but since uh, uh, the garnish of this a lot of times is orange peel, I like to get orange bitters. Um, and uh, it's just a little flavoring. Think of it as like spice or seasoning. Um, maraschino cherries, did I say that right? You did. Right? Luxardo is mm -hmm. the best. There's different kinds you can get, but these are definitely the best. They're in like a dark syrup. Yes. It's not like your average red maraschino. And, uh, uh, orange. orange and uh, your favorite bourbon bourbon then, then a uh, then a whiskey um, I like bullet it's just a uh, you know it's just the fan tried and true the fan favorite right now for if you're gonna do a lot of mixers I think we think bullet is good if you were just gonna be sipping the whiskey oh then that's where you get into all the different all sorts of better options Scotch whiskey whiskeys Irish whiskeys all that kind of stuff um, Jewish whiskeys yes. So uh, you want to take uh, a napkin, or in this case, a folded uh, paper towel, because it doesn't really matter. And you are going to take a sugar cube and you're going to place it on the paper towel. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're basically going to season, in a sense, uh, the sugar cube with the orange bitters. Um, a lot of times I say just one drop, but uh, certainly you know, two and three is better than one, right? But here's where you can kind of season to taste, much like putting salt in a, a dish or something like that, so. Okay, but the point is, is that the paper towel keeps you from getting bitters straight into the glass, because you really, really want to kind of soak, soak the, uh, the sugar cube. And then we're gonna drop that into the glass. All right, set this aside. And this is where you take a, a muddler, or in this case, the little spoon that's in our set, has a nice weighted thing. And you're going to uh, crush the uh, sugar cube. Just break your glass. She wanted to be part of it. Great. But you want to break it down, like so. Next step, you put some ice cubes in. A few ice cubes. Yeah, my hands are clean. Okay. All right, after. What's your drink? Thank you. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, we're gonna stir this up a little bit. We're just kind of getting the sugar, kind of coating the ice. I want that to stir the stir in. We'll use that for something else. Okay, and then the good part, we are going to put in a shot each of whiskey. That is that middle mark there. So that was a little That's mine. generous. Okay. And so we're gonna make doubles. Oh. doubles Does being, that mean we need two sugar cubes then? No, it just means you're gonna use two shots. But at this point, we're gonna mix this up and stir it. You're just trying to dissolve 
the sugar cube and the bitters all at once, like a set. All right. Now what we're going to do uh, is we're going to add another shot into each one. Are you trying to get me drunk? No, I'm trying to make an old fashioned. Um, and we're going to put some more ice cubes. And we're going to stir again. Are old fashions on the rocks? Well, that is on the rocks. Well, I didn't know if you were going to strain the ice out or something. No, no, no. no. It's kind of all made together in the one glass. What's the history of the old fashioned? Involve. That I did not look up before we did this video. I've read it many times, but not to the point of retaining it. Yeah, it's fine. But uh, there's your homework. Google it. Uh, but it is one of the first, I believe, cocktails made that's, you know, I hope I got that right. Now we're going to, um, uh, we're going to garnish with, uh, it's cherries. Yeah. I'll do that. See, again, it's, it, the order doesn't matter. It's just as long as you get it in there. Orange peel. So very, I'm peeling off the rind and then you can even go to the extent rind, rind of uh, getting rid of the flesh of it inside. So I'm kind of filleting off the, uh, white part. If I was really good at this. I wouldn't have cut that to begin with. But anyways, as you can see, I'm trying to remove that. To okay. show the pores. You sure. want it to be porous. Yes. So I'm, and you're going to kind of twist it and get a little effervescent. And then I always like to kind of wipe the rim just to give a little taste and flavor there. I'm going to do the same to mine. Maybe I can do a better job with this one. Again, just really trying to cut it as thin as possible. Three inches long or so. That's good. I'm going to twist. And if you look really close, when you do that, it kind of sprays it out. So you're, you're basically putting a little uh, film on top. Again, it's all part of the experience. I'm going to wipe the rim like that. Here comes our cherries. And uh, here's one thing I like to do though, that I, I don't really tell anybody, and this, this is where I just kind of make it my own. I like the sauce. The syrup. The syrup. So I always put a spoonful of that oh, in the drink. Okay, the secret. Got a spoonful. And then I put the cherry. cherry. The cherry on top. The cherry. You can do a little stir if you want. I would like a stir. Just like that. Just some, just some apple dressing. Okay, yeah, it's done. Um, and now we drink. There you go. So obviously you can use different bitters. Um, you can vary your amount of alcohol. Um, and when such, you, but the you, ingredients are pretty much the same when it comes, and obviously the brand of uh, of whiskey that you that you choose to use uh, can can vary. And when you cheers, always make eye contact with the person you are toasting with before you sip. That's a rule. It's very common. Let's try. Cheers. Yummy. That's good. That's good. Sweet. Toasty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hey, Jasper and Sarah, thanks. I think I want to go to their house for drinks now. Uh, but there's a pandemic, so I can't do that. Uh, anyway, I hope you have enjoyed our first uh, episode on knife skills and everything about choosing knives and caring for knives and using knives and how to hold knives, all the goodies. And I hope you learned a lot about the mixology and the things that you need uh, to have a, a well-stocked bar. Uh, so, hey, until next time, when I hope my animals don't decide to interrupt us, but you know, hmm. Uh, oh, there was one last thing that I didn't mention. So you'll notice that my board is nice and secure to stainless steel. And that's not by accident. Uh, you can buy little grippers in, in chef's supplies that you put underneath 
your board, you put the board on it and it will hold it. Uh, I, of course, couldn't find one. <laughs> so typical. Uh, and I, I resorted to old school, which is what we used to do in chef school. That's a wet paper towel. So you just wet a paper towel, you put your board on it, and there it is. It holds the board in place so it doesn't move on you. Okay, hey, uh, I hope you guys have a great week. Uh, and thanks for watching. And, you know, savourer vie, savour life.